in question 7 in terms of their structure why metals are good conductor of electricity so reason why the metals are good conductor because they have free electron uh, sir can you hear me yes uh, hamza uh, is the one i sent you correct in the homework the drawing of water yeah that was right as well Because they have free electron, that's why metals are good conductor or delocalized electron. In the next question, they ask a, a cylindrical wire W1 of length L and a cross sectional area A has a resistance of 16. Then another cylindrical wire has a length L by 2, cross sectional area 2A made of same material. So when two wires are made up of same material, So when two wires are made up of same material, the formula is R1 A1 over L1 equals R2 A2 over L2. So R1 is the first resistance which is 16, A1 is the first area that is A and the length is L. R2 is the second resistance, we don't know. Area is 2A and the length is L by 2 or 0.5L. So this A will cancel with A, L will cancel with L. 0.5 is divided, other side it will multiply. So 16 multiplied by 0.5 divided by 2, that will be equal to R2. So 0 0.5, mul 16 multiplied by 0 0.5, that is 8 and 8 divided by 2, that's equal to 4 ohm. Regarding question 16b, I just explained the idea that what you will do, you will have a ripple tank, you will have a source which will generate water waves and you will have a barrier. Just produce the water waves and observe or capture or take the image by using a camera. That was the only last part which was about I was writing or typing when I was disconnected from the meeting. The distribution of the mark, two marks were for the figure which you draw and remaining two were there, how, how you generate or produce and how you will see the water waves. About question 6b. Then W1 and W2 are now connected in parallel. So if two resistors are connected in parallel, If the first resistance was in the question 16 and the second is 4. So what will be the combined resistance? So you can use the product divided by sum. So 16 into 4 divided by 16 plus 4. So 16 into 4, that is 64 divided by 20, so that is equals to 3.2 ohms. The next part, the parallel pair of resistors in B2 is connected to a battery that is made from three cells each of EMF E, electromotive force. There is a current in each resistor. State the EMF of the battery. So if they are all connected in series, if one EMF, one voltage is E, then the total voltage due to the three cells, the combination, that will be equal to 3E. At the last, I will repeat question 6B. If still you find it uh, incomplete, I will repeat question 6B at the last. Then, the current in W1 is I1 and the current in W2 is I2. So when two resistors are connected in parallel, the current which is passing through W1 is I1, W1 is 16 ohm and W2 is 4 ohms. The current which is passing through I2, uh, sorry W2 is I2 and the total current which is coming from the battery is IB.
so the question is which statement is correct so i b the total current which is entering will distribute between i1 and i2 and because this is having a smaller resistance so it will have more current so we can say i b will be greater than i2 and i2 will be greater than i1 so this one second last is a right statement In question 8, in a lab at uh, normal temperature, 200 gram of water is poured into a beaker. A thermometer is placed and the reading is 22. A small piece of ice was added to a water one by one and the mixture is stirred after each addition of the ice has melted. The process continues until the temperature recorded is zero. The total mass of ice added to the water was found to be 60 gram. Specific heat capacity of a water is 4.2. Calculate the thermal energy lost by water. For water, there is a change in temperature. Whenever energy uh, we want to calculate by change in temperature, E is equals to Cm del 30. Where C is a specific heat, M is a mass, and delta T is a change in temperature because originally it is 22 and now the temperature of the mixture is 0. So it will be 22 minus 0, which is also 22. So how much energy is being lost by the water, which is 18,000 joules. 18,480 joules, which will be the 480 joule is a complete exact answer according to, but the, according to marketing scheme, I think it will be, they took, I, I think 18,000. But 18,000, you will write, you can write in two, three significant figure. You can write 18.4 or 18.5 exponent 3. The next part, assume that the thermal energy lost by the water is gained by the ice. Calculate the specific latent heat. So latent heat is energy divided by mass. The energy which is 18,480 divided by mass of the ice which is 60. So you will get 308 joule per gram because the originally the mass was in gram. That's why you're getting joule per gram. Then suggest a reason why an inaccuracy in the value of specific Latin heat of fusion of ice assume that the temperature reading and the values of the mass and mass of ice are accurate so heat law basically heat loss by water to the surrounding or heat gained by the ice from the surrounding so heat water might it's not like all of the heat energy is absorbed by the water some of the heat energy might be lost to the surrounding from the water or ice might take energy from the surrounding not all from so heat lost by water to the surrounding or ice might gain energy from surrounding. Even if a container is covered, because what happened, example, this is a covered container. It is filled with water and we add an ice. We add ice cubes to this. Ice cube will float. So because they're exposed to the surrounding air. So these ice cubes likely they can take some of the energy from the surrounding. Even the container is covered. If it's a vacuum, then you can not mention heat in terms of uh, convection or conduction heat transfer but practically there is always a heat loss or heat gain in this question a student wanted to demagnetize a permanent magnet 
for some of the student because still they are studying magnetism this part is still uh, left for magnetism because you are discuss we are discussing magnetism part so so for the group which i already completed this topic they can understand the answer but for other uh, this week we will complete this magnetism uh, but i'll discuss this question for them place a magnet in a long coil switch on a large alternating current switch off the current and remove the bar magnet from the coil state and explain whether the steps will always be able to demagnetize no what is the reason for the that current for should, it shouldn't be off the current shouldn't be off uh, either current should not be off or one thing that uh, we should vary the current that can be done and we should not keep the magnet at one place we should gradually take the magnet out and first thing first most important thing when you want to demagnetize a magnet as we have a direction north south east and west so whenever we want to demagnetize a permanent magnet we always place in a north west east west direction why we are not placing in a north uh, north south direction because otherwise earth magnetic field might magnetize it so we have say example this is a permanent magnet we so we first place in a east west direction and the coil is there a solenoid and we pass an alternating current when we pass an alternating current we should not switch off the current that is one thing and we should gradually either take it out from this solenoid to make it permit to make it permanently demagnetize or permanently remove the magnetic field from this magnet permanent magnet so it will not whether the question is it is effective so answer is no the current should not be switched off and the magnet should be taken out from solenoid or we should change the current in the solenoid so either we can take it out or we can ch change the current in the solenoid to make it permanently demag or demagnetize or remove the magnetic field strength figure 9.1 shows up a, a coil supplied with a current using a split ring so basically it's a dc motor state and explain any motion in the coil so how we can state and explain any motion in the coil positive and negative so when the current will pass so if i say side ab what is the direction of the force on side ab using a fleming's left hand rule upward left hand first finger represent the magnetic field second represent direction of the current so downwards yeah. downward and the others so this is downward uh, this will be upward so what will happen this coil will rotate in this manner this is if you are looking from here how it appear clockwise or anti clockwise clockwise so basically it will rotate clockwise so when the current flows from one side the wire will experience a force the current passing through a wire produces a magnetic field which cuts the magnetic field of a permanent magnet experience the force and rotate the coil continuously in clockwise direction so current passing through a coil
so the current which is passing through the coil produce magnetic field which cuts the magnetic field of a permanent magnet experience force and cause the clockwise rotation or moment or turning effect And the direction of the current reverses every half cycle. That also you can mention that's the purpose of the split ring. In the next part, the coil in figure 9.1 consists of three turns. The magnetic field strength is M and the total current is 2 ampere. These all factors, strength of magnetic field, coil and number of turns, they increases the turning effect. Now complete the table, give the turning effect of for the change choose your answer so you can use a screen annotation to mention if we multiply the current by 3 what happened to the turning effect sorry multiply by 4 not 3 so 2 multiply by 4 that's it so magnetic effect will be 4 turning effect will be 4 times if we double the turns so it will be twice and in the last one, if we halve the magnetic field, then it will be T by D. Then explain why high voltage, explain the voltage, explain why the voltage of a supply to a primary coil of a transformer must be alternating. Why a transformer? Basically, how the transformer works, or working of a transformer. You have a wire. The side where we connect the supply, we call that as primary coil. And where we don't have any supply source, we call that as secondary. Because what happened when we apply an alternating current, so alternating current, current produces magnetic field. But alternating current produce variable magnetic field. So what is the purpose of alternating current? If it, there was a direct current, this will be magnetized but constant magnetic field. So what happened when variable magnetic field or changing magnetic field is there, it induces EMF in the secondary coil. So what is the ad why we use in a primary we why we use an alternating current alternating current produce variable magnetic field or changing magnetic field and change in the magnetic field can produce emf in the secondary The next part, figure 10.1 shows a transformer. So you can see a transformer. The side where we connect the source that is called a primary coil and where we obtain the output that is called a secondary coil. So there are 8000 turns in the primary. The primary is connected to 240 volt main supply and 6 volt. A uh, lamp is connected to a secondary with a full brightness. Calculate the number of turns in secondary. So, first thing, which type of transformer is this? Step up or step down?
Which type of transformer is this? So it is a step down transformer because it is reducing the voltage or the number of turns of secondary are less than number of turns of primary. So the formula which relate the turns with the voltage Vs over Vp is equals to Ns over Np. Vs, this is Vs, Vp, number of turns of primary Np are there and Ns we want to find. So what's the final answer? The number of turns of the primary That is 200 turns. The next part, the current in the lamp is 2 ampere. The transformer is 100% efficient. Calculate the current in the primary. If something is 100% efficient, the power input and the power output will be same. So input power is voltage of primary and current of primary and output power is voltage of secondary and current of secondary. Voltage of the primary, that is uh, 240. The current in the primary, we don't know. Voltage in the secondary is 6 and the current in the secondary is 2 ampere. So when you find the primary current, it is 0 0.05 ampere. The primary circuit contain 2 ampere fuse. Calculate the maximum number of the lamps identically uh, to the lamp uh, in 2 can be connected in parallel in the secondary without a fuse blowing. So if one lamp is there that is 0 0.05. If we How many lamps should be there so that the current will be So maximum, basically for each lamp it is 0 0.05. So for 2 ampere, maximum it will be 40 lamps. Because the total current divided by current in each lamp, what I will get, I will get the number of the lamps. So maximum I can connect 40 lamps before the fuse will below. And the last one, atomic physics, a radon is there, is a radioactive, it can be represented by a neutral atom of a radon. You can use a screen annotation to complete this. The number of proton, neutron and electrons. It's a neutral atom, so proton and electron should be same. Yeah, so 136 neutron, the difference, 86 proton and 86 electron. That's right. 136, 86 and 86. Thank you for your participation. Next is 11B. A radon is there. It is emitting out alpha particle. Alpha particle means helium nuclei. So if it is emitting out alpha particle, it converts into polonium. So if this is 222, 4 are there in alpha particles, so this will be 218. And 86, two, 2 particles are removed, so this will be 84. Then the half-life question. A radon 222 has a half-life of 3.8 days. At certain time, a sample contains 6 exponent, uh, 6 .4 exponent 6 radon nuclei. Calculate the number of alpha particles emitted in 7.6 days basically number of alpha particle emitted or number of uh, atoms which become stable or number of radon which emitted our uh, which converted into polonium so if we have 6.4 into 10 power 6 atoms which are radioactive after uh, the half-life means time taken by half of the sample to be stable. So after 3.8 days, it will be 3.2 into 10 to the power 6, radon will be there. Then after another 3.8 days, 
half life means time taken by half of the radioactive sample to be stable that will be 1.6 into 10 power 6 so these are the radon now how many radon have decayed that is the number of alpha particle emitted so when we subtract originally we were having 6.4 now we have 1.6 so how much how many have decayed that is equals to 4.8 into 10 power 6 and this is the number of the L particle which have decayed or this will be the number of alpha particle which are emitted out because one radon as you can see in the previous equation that one radon is emitting out one alpha particle so if this many radon converting to polonium then how many alpha particle will be there same number how many radon have decayed And about question 6b, which I was discussing in the last session, that what we will do, we will have for this purpose, we should have a dipper, which are there in a water or a ripple tank. What is the purpose of that? It is used to generate or produce water waves. So a ripple tank. filled with water dippers to produce water waves a barrier made up of wood or a glass or uh, any solid metal Then the procedure, what we'll do, we'll produce water waves by vibrating the dipper and observe the motion of waves with a camera. We can also use a camera for this. So this was the and you can draw the wave front, the barrier, and the reflected one. 